Welcome back to International Relations 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is covert nuclear programs. And we start off today exactly where we finished last time in discussing preventive war. We saw that preventive war is straightforward when power shifts are visible. If you're thinking about whether to develop a nuclear weapon or not, and I see your decision, my preventive war calculus is easy. I compare the number of concessions I'll have to give you in the future to the number of costs that I'll have to pay if I fight a preventive war now. If those costs are relatively small compared to the number of concessions I'll have to give you later, I prefer fighting a preventive war. In turn, you know not to develop a weapon. If you try doing that, you'll pay a cost associated with building a nuclear weapon, but you'll never actually access it, because I'll fight a preventive war, I'll stop you from doing that, and I'll pay the costs associated with preventive war, but so will you. You'll pay all sorts of inefficient costs, and those are the types of things that you would want to avoid. But all of that gets thrown out of the window when you have arms construction that's not visible. If I can't see whether you're developing a weapon or not, it makes it really difficult for me to be able to threaten preventive war against you. Moreover, even if you say, hey, I'm not going to develop a weapon, please don't fight a preventive war against me, I might not know whether you're actually trustworthy on that. You might try to sneak in a nuclear weapon while I'm not looking and be able to enjoy the benefits of having that nuclear weapon while I'm here not fighting a preventive war and perhaps regretting it later on. We haven't exactly seen a scenario that looks like this. We've seen a framework in decision-making that's been like this before. We've seen two-by-two -two games like this previously, like a prisoner's dilemma and a stag hunt. But covert proliferation has a different feel to it. So in this structure, we have a declining state that can launch a preventive war or pass and essentially keep the peace, and a rising state that can choose whether to build or not. Importantly, in these sorts of two-by-two -two game frameworks, each player moves without knowing what the other person has done. So relevant to the decision here, the declining state, when it chooses whether to launch preventive war or not, doesn't know whether the rising state has built a nuclear weapon or not, or at least is trying to build a nuclear weapon or not. This game has a different sort of solution compared to a prisoner's dilemma or a stag hunt that we've seen before. It's a much more of a guessing game where the declining state wants to guess whether the rising state is building a nuclear weapon. And if it is building a nuclear weapon, it should want to prevent. And if it's not building a nuclear weapon, then it'd be kind of ridiculous for the declining state to launch a preventive war against an arms program that isn't actually happening. So it would want to keep the peace. Now, rather than solving this covert proliferation game directly, we're going to actually do that in the next lecture. Here, I just want to introduce to you the idea of guessing games. And to do that, we're going to look at something different. We're going to look at soccer penalty kicks, a very simplified version of this, in fact. Suppose that a striker can either aim left or right. That's the guy who's kicking toward the goal. And the goalie can either dive left or right. As with this covert proliferation decision, this is essentially a simultaneous move game. The goalie, despite the fact that he or she may dive left or right, after the striker has kicked? Well, in practice, the striker is kicking the ball so fast that the goalie doesn't have any time to be able to base his or her move off of where the striker is aiming. He or she essentially has to guess ahead of time. So that's the type of game that we're looking at. It fits in this simultaneous move framework. And we're going to look at a very simple version of this in terms of the payoffs. We're going to imagine that both the striker and the goalie are superhuman. What I mean by that is that if the goalie dives in the correct direction, he'll definitely stop the shot. And if the striker kicks the ball in an opposite direction from where the goalie is diving, the striker will never miss. How should they play under those conditions? I want you to think about that for a moment. And if you have any idea, you might want to go ahead and type it down below. If not, I'm going to tell you how you should think about this sort of game. First, we need to actually write down some payoffs. That's what we've done here. The striker can either kick left or kick right. Goalie can either dive left or dive right. If the striker goes in the same direction as the goalie, then the shot is stopped and no goal is scored. So zeros in those cases. And if the striker kicks in a direction where the goalie isn't going, well, now the striker scores a goal and the goalie gives up a goal. And that's reflected in the payoffs. Think about this. Could it be that the striker predictably kicks left and the goalie predictably dives left? In other words, ahead of time, before this interaction takes place, someone could say, ah, yes, that's definitely going to happen. You bet everything, bet the entire world on that actually happening. Well, very quickly, you would realize that that can't be guessed ahead of time. And the reason it can't be guessed ahead of time is that if the goalie were definitely going to dive left, 
the striker wouldn't want to kick left. He'd want to kick right and score a goal. So they can't reliably be kicking left and diving left. Well, if they can't be doing that, can they be reliably kicking right and diving left? Again, no. Here it's not the striker that would want to switch strategies, but if the goalie knew that the striker were going to kick right, well, the goalie would want to switch to diving right to stop that shot. But I think you can figure out where this is going. We can't have a situation where the striker is kicking right and the goalie is diving right reliably. If that were the case, then now the striker would want to kick left and score the goal. But we can't have a situation where the striker is reliably kicking left and the goalie is reliably diving right, because then the goalie would want to switch to diving left and stop that shot. So you'll notice here that we have a bit of a cycle in the preferences, where the striker and goalie can't agree ahead of time on one particular outcome, because if they were to, one of them would want to switch over. And you'll note also that this isn't an artifact of the goalie and the striker being superhuman. For example, if we said that the striker would sometimes miss randomly if he kicked left, even if the goalie dived right, we would still have this cycling in the preferences where you can't behave reliably if you were to be in this situation, because then the other side would be able to exploit you. If you're the striker and you always kick left, the goalie would exploit you by always diving left. So a game like this, penalty kicks, is essentially a guessing game. You have to behave randomly, or as if randomly, in order to avoid being exploited. If you're the striker, you should sometimes be kicking left and sometimes be kicking right. And the goalie, if you're the goalie, you should be sometimes diving left and sometimes diving right. And that's straightforward, and that's actually something that we observe when players are in the World Cup playing soccer and in a penalty kick situation. They behave randomly like this. And what we'll see in the next lecture is that preventive war under the scenario that I just gave you, where a declining state can't recognize whether the rising state is building or not, it essentially has this sort of guessing game framework where the players need to behave randomly, sometimes choosing one action and sometimes choosing the other action to avoid being exploited. I hope you enjoy this. I hope to see you next time when I talk to you about how this soccer penalty kick game relates back to preventive war. Join me then.